To kick off my series of expert interviews, my first guest is Professor Tommy Wood on the subject of long COVID and metabolism. We're going to cover why active people might be more prone to long COVID, the role stress might play, what the science says about supplements, whether hyperbaric oxygen stacks up as a treatment, and just what the balance is between biological processes and our state of mind. Enjoy. Tommy, I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your background in terms of uh, your career and you know where you've been to date. Yeah, sure. So I'm currently a professor of paediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, how I got there uh, was via uh, living and training, uh, or most of my living and training being in the UK. Um, so I got an undergraduate degree from Cambridge, uh, medical school at Oxford, then worked as a junior doctor in central London for a couple of years uh, before I moved to Norway for my PhD. Um, and then after that, uh, came over to, to the States. Um, so I'm basically a, a full-time academic most of the time, uh, but I've worked um, quite a bit in the digital health uh, arena, particularly around um, looking at blood-based uh, biomarkers to try and optimize health and performance uh, in athletes. Uh, and I still do work with a number of elite athletes, particular Formula One drivers currently through a company called Hints of Performance. Um, but then also some work with uh, various chronic uh, disease uh, patients in that, in that same kind of setting. So my understanding is that you have a pretty good handle on the ins and outs of metabolism. Is that fair? Uh, I, I hope so. I would never, I don't think anybody is ever going to be a true expert in metabolism. You can be an expert in different parts of it, just like it's almost impossible to be a true expert in the immune system. It's just so complex. Um, but yes, uh, hopefully to, to a certain degree, I, I can say yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So my first question for you is why do you think that active individuals and especially endurance athletes are particularly prone to long COVID? Yeah. So, I will start by saying, maybe not very helpfully, but start by saying I'm not an expert in long COVID. I have not worked with a huge number of people with long COVID, but I've worked with a lot of athletes, particularly those who are overtrained and overstressed uh, over the years. Uh, so I've kind of come at this from a first principles approach. Like, what do you see in overtrained athletes? Um, how does that align with some of the things that you see that increased risk of particularly acute COVID, what's the overlap, you know, and how might those things then, you know, explain long COVID in somebody who is ostensibly, quote unquote, healthy, um, rather than sort of like the acute disease that you might see in somebody who has, say, some kind of metabolic disease. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of it comes down to simply the stresses that we put ourselves under uh, as endurance athletes. Um, and the end result being a significant burden of oxidative stress and a depletion of the capacity that you have to respond to stresses. Um, so there are multiple lines of evidence that might support this. So we know that uh, in well-trained athletes or highly trained athletes, they have a bigger um, depletion of their reserves um, in, in terms of oxidative stress, a bigger oxidative stress response to exercise than say moderately trained athletes. So there's like a U-shaped curve, we might call it. So you get better, uh, better ability to handle oxidative stress with some exercise um, and then as your burden increases then that gets worse just because you're continuously stressing that system um, and then uh, in the setting of that you know we've we've seen both historically and very recent papers have come out that shown that if you do a, a large volume of high intensity exercise which is a, what a lot of amateur endurance athletes do you can create uh, this sort of overburden of oxidative stress which affects mitochondrial function and can then also create what we call insulin resistance, which is what you would see in type two diabetes in particular. Um, however, you can create that same scenario with a very high burden of exercise and that's through an increase in oxidative stress and inflammation. And then these things affect our ability to respond to the sort of first wave of a virus coming in. So then you may get a greater viral load uh, and then you get sort of the downstream uh, problematic effects of that. And how applicable is this to maybe people who weren't necessarily highly trained endurance athletes, but were maybe active and under other kinds of stresses at the time? It seems like there's a lot of people who, when you ask them about their long COVID experience, their long COVID symptoms, as opposed to their acute COVID symptoms, are often triggered by some sort of 
stress it stress type events is there anything here that may they may not have been super highly trained mm. but it does seem that stress plays some kind of role here um is there anything you could say about that yeah th th that's a great question and it does seem like where uh where where that research exists that some of the same things um do happen so um some of the changes in the immune system immune function white blood cell markers uh that you would see in both in metabolic disease in overtrained athletes um can also happen in the setting of chronic psychological stress um and sort of um in line with that you know, if you're chronically psychologically stressed, you may also be, say, sleep deprived. Or, and then these same things also happen in the setting of sleep deprivation. So even though you're otherwise in relatively good health, these uh, chronic effects of both psychological stress and sleep deprivation, probably being the two most common ones, um, can have these similar effects both on uh, metabolic function and immune function. Um, so I think you might have seen my previous film on the NAD plus sort of deficiency mm. theory as part of this. Does that make sense to you? Uh, is there anything else that you think might be going on on a met metabolic level with long COVID? So I think uh, that theory is essentially to, I mean, these are two, the things that I'm describing, you know, largely based around oxidative stress and the, the NAD depletion theory followed by mast cell activation syndrome and dysautonomia, I think these are basically two sides of the same coin. So if you are sleep deprived, then you don't turn over NAD properly and you can cause NAD depletion. If you have high levels of oxidative stress, then um, you damage your DNA that activates something called PARP1, which depletes NAD. Uh, and so that certainly fits there. Uh, we also know that um, acute and chronic inflammation and oxidative stress and psychological stresses can uh, trigger the uh, degranulation of mast cells, which can then cause inflammation and can kind of create a, a feed forward effect. So I think I don't know exactly what the the trigger, you know, the single top of the chain is, uh, and it may be different in different people depending on the, on their um, setup, what they've been been exposed to. Uh, but but I think all of these pathways intersect and, and, and make perfect sense from that standpoint. And is there anything you can say about the cell danger response um, and describe maybe what that is and, and if that might play a role in long COVID? Yeah, so the, the cell danger response is probably uh, best uh, described uh, by a professor called uh, Robert Navio. Um, and he has a number of different a number of different theories that kind of center around how the body responds to um, both chronic um, and acute uh, inflammatory stresses. And these are basically um, coordinated responses that are there to try and help you uh, ward off the, the pathogen or whatever it is that you're trying to deal with. And as part of this, you obviously get these changes in immune function, chronic inflammation, and you also get shifts in mitochondrial function. Uh, and you down-regulate mitochondrial function. And he's shown that in people with um, chronic fatigue, you know, if we think of that as a, a post-viral symptom in, in, in or syndrome in, you know, the, the majority of cases, you see a, the hypometabolism. So the mitochondria basically turned down the volume, turned down the, the throughput. And this is part of a coordinated response to try and, um, you know, at the time ward off the pathogen. Of course, if you can't get rid of it, all that stays the same chronically, then you're going to get reduced exercise tolerance, uh, brain fog, fatigue, because you're just not, you know, moving enough energy or not, not able to move enough energy through the system. So these are all kind of, rather than, thinking about it as this singular negative thing, it is part of a coordinated response um, in the body, uh, but you also then need to recover from it over, over time. And it's the same with any inflammation. We, you know, we, we always think of inflammation as bad. It's important to help you, you know, get rid of the virus or whatever it is that you're trying to fight off, uh, recover from an injury, uh, but you also need to resolve it. And I think uh, where we're getting stuck is in people unable to resolve the problem. And then you get these, these sort of chronic symptoms. Uh, and what? What does the science say in terms of what people who may be experiencing this sort of thing can do to aid their recovery, uh, whether it's behaviours, whether it's medications, whether it's supplements? Yeah, that, that's, that's another great question. And uh, interestingly, there isn't a huge amount of you know hard science, randomised controlled trials, that kind of, you know, the pinnacle of evidence-based medicine, because, you know, this isn't 
uh, an area that, that has received a lot of attention, say, compared to Alzheimer's disease or, or other uh, significant diseases. Um, however, uh, there are some, you know, some things that, that I think that, that we can talk about. So there are some small pilot trials that looked at uh, replacing or su using supplements that sort of provide the nutrients that are required for mitochondrial function um, and so you, you can you can buy these supplements and there's a few of them that exist but my preferred way is just to get that from food and if you are trying to get the things that are required for mitochondrial function then good things to eat are things that have a lot of mitochondria so liver and heart being fabulous sources of most of the things that you need for mitochondrial function they have high high amounts of niacin high amounts of uh the, the rest of the B vitamins, um, and they're cheap and pretty much anybody can get access to them. Um, I think um, you can also, so if we're thinking about the uh, oxidative stress side, there's lots of evidence about using something called NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is a glutathione precursor uh, in um, metabolic disease, you know, then it's, it's used very heavily in, in the hospital. It's the treatment for paracetamol overdose because it helps replenish glutathione so you don't get liver failure. Um, and so in multiple settings where there's significant oxidative stress, replacing uh, or using NAC to, re to replenish glutathione is, is, is very well evidence-based. Um, in some people, particularly in athletes, uh, the rate-limiting step of glutathione production is not cysteine, uh, it's actually glycine, which is a different amino acid. Um, and it, particularly in athletes who are turning over a lot of tissue as they damage it with their training, you might need, you know, several grams of glycine a day, which is difficult to, to get from food. So get it. So a collagen supplement or taking glycine itself can, can sometimes be, be beneficial there. Um, if um, you have do have histamine related symptoms, then uh, cofactors for histamine break the enzymes that break down histamine are worth thinking about. So that's B6, uh, copper and vitamin C. Um, copper particularly important because I know, you know, as people think about immunity, uh, they, uh, I think even in the, in the NAD uh, repletion uh, protocol, the zinc, but zinc can inhibit, can inhibit the uptake of copper and you can become copper deficient over time if you're taking high doses of zinc. So taking some copper at the same time is important. Um, so I think from a supplement standpoint, that's probably most of it. I, I also generally recommend uh, creatine for most people. Uh, it seems to improve uh, cognitive function, uh, 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 can mitigate some of, the, some of the effects, sort of like the mental health side effects, you know, very good for the brain in, in multiple ways, also for physical uh, performance, um, and can sort of buffer some of the burden that if you're taking niacin as part of that NAD repletion protocol that, that you had before, nice, uh, turning over niacin or breaking down excess niacin um, is very uh, demanding on the methylation cycle of the body. Uh, so something that then supports that choline and creatine uh, being great. So eggs and some creatine uh, worth thinking about at least. Uh, from a behavior standpoint, um, like I mentioned earlier, a robust circadian rhythm is, is essential for normal NAD turnover and replenishing NAD. You replenish NAD at night, essentially. So uh, both uh, doing anything you can to optimize sleep, as well as establishing a robust circadian rhythm. So that's getting bright light during the day and darkness at night, uh, particularly important. Um, and then you know, all the other things are going to matter. So anything you could do to mitigate stress, uh, improving uh, diet, nutrient quality, uh, like we mentioned, social interaction, you know, those kinds of things are very important for, um, you know, just overall well-being, but also can have some anti-inflammatory effects. You know, it's sort of like being, we are social beings. And when we remove ourselves from that, that can have really significant effects on our physiology, su surprisingly. Um, and then if we're thinking about trying to recover um, function in the system. One thing that we, we know is that in order to increase capacity, you have to increase demand. Um, and so, you know, this is where the idea of graded exercise comes in. I know that that's not particularly popular, um, which, which, is which is fine. I think it makes sense from a, from a, a biochemical standpoint, but it can be very difficult for people to enact. So the alternative that, that I've thought of, and this really comes from the idea of neuroplasticity or trying to develop new connections in the brain. I think it's going to be the same for the, for the body in general. So cognitive function, like brain fog uh, in particular, being an issue here. I think learning a new skill 
could be really useful for a number of reasons. You're creating new demand, but you're doing it in something where you have no pressure to perform in a way that you did previously, right? So if I'm going to learn Spanish, I have never spoken Spanish. So I have no previous me to compare myself to. Whereas if you're trying to get back into your exercise, you are constantly worried that you're not performing as how you were performing previously. So learning a new skill, I think is really beneficial. You can do that in a social environment. It can be literally anything. Um, however, about Duolingo, I mean, you yeah, know, exactly. Cool, isn't it? And it's a game, yeah. Duolingo gamifies it. So there's a really yeah. easy tip, actually, just to try and get some of, yeah. Yeah. And so, so this, yeah, so, so learning these new skills and importantly, some of the frustration in learning is actually an important trigger for neuroplasticity. So if you become a bit frustrated while you do it, that's okay. Um, and then, you know, once you get like 10 or 20 minutes of frustration, then you can back off and, you know, come back tomorrow. Um, on top of that, um, one of the best triggers for neuroplasticity is challenging um, the is challenging your balance. And so, again, like easy skills you can learn, anything that's balance related. So I thought of like slacklining, right? It doesn't require, I mean, just like you basically put um, this sort of rope between two trees and then and then try and balance on it. Or it could just be a, a low wall where you try and balance. Or, or, so sta or, or stand on one leg. And stand on one leg. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. all of these, anything that challenges your balance system is a great trigger for learning because... Uh, you know, it has some inherent danger in it. And then your body is has, has a greater need to adapt to it. So literally anything that you can do that that creates that is a new motor skill and includes some balance. So it could be dancing or yoga or any of those things uh, that we mentioned, I think will be a, a really good trigger. And again, you don't have anything else to previously compare yourself to. So, you know, you can slowly learn over time and there's no real pressure there. So I, I think that's kind of that kind of summarizes most of the things that I would that I would recommend. And, and certainly yoga has anecdotally been very helpful for lots of people. Mm. Um, and I think there's a number of things that yoga does, um, apart from just the balance and the physical mm. side of it. Elsie has to be yoga at a physical level that's inside your activity spectrum that's not going mm. to induce post-exertional malaise. But, um, but yeah, I would certainly recommend that too. Um, so I've got another question for you here, which you may not be expecting, but is there anything you can tell me about the science of hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Because this has become quite a trendy thing to do mm. with long COVID. And it seems like there is some logic and science behind why this might help. I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yes. Yeah, so po like possibly, and I, I've certainly heard this uh, as well. Um, the, the, the problem with most of the research behind hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that it's really not very good. Um, and so like the majority of the, the papers and the research you'll see out there basically um, invoke my favorite quotation from Voltaire, which is that medicine consists of entertaining the patient while nature cures the disease. So you just keep doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy and we don't know whether it actually improved anything or just whether you're going to get better over time anyway. Um, however, you know, certainly I know that uh, you've reported, others have reported that when they get in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, they see things like improvements in heart rate variability. Um, it's when, when that happens like acutely like in the in the moment i'm not certain of the um importance there but if that can improve if it changes heart rate variability over time you know trends in heart rate variability are important rather than just like the minute like what's happening right now um so that's potentially beneficial and i think one of the reasons why this could be happening so if we go back to some of the work of uh, bob navio that we that we mentioned uh, in the setting of um hypo metabolism you know we've kind of turned down mitochondrial function because you know part of this response to uh this inflammatory or, or oxidative stressor uh, what that does is it reduces the amount of oxygen that's getting into mitochondria um because that's part of reduced um demand re reduced demand from the mitochondria however one of the ways to overcome uh reduced uh sort of reduced capacity so, so i mentioned the other way which is to increase demand you can, to a certain extent, also increase supply. So if you're, in, if you're uh, doing hyperbaric oxygen, you are essentially forcing more oxygen deeper into the cell, uh, which may then overcome some of the deficits by providing uh, more oxygen to mitochondria and then allowing them uh, to, to increase their function. So that's purely hypothetical because you just randomly asked me that question. But, but I think that there is certainly some, some potential benefit there. 
could you actually just just define what oxidative stress is? Because it's a term we hear floating about mm. a lot, but maybe, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, 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 so again, um, something that's actually very important and is part, a part of normal physiology, right? So, so anytime, almost anytime you stress the body, you create uh, an excess of what they are unpaired electrons. So it's free ele electrons like to come in pairs. Um, and if anybody remembers like chemistry from, from a secondary school, um, but uh, when you uh, sort of create these stresses and like, so exercise is a good one, but you know, multiple other ones can do it too. Um, basically because of the process of metabolism, you know, we, you create these species, reactive oxygen species, these species that have these unpaired electrons. Um, and, doing so triggers beneficial adaptations such that we become better at dealing with those. So there are multiple systems in the body to then essentially bind up and get rid of these excess uh, unpaired electrons. So glutathione being one, you know, the probably the best known intracellular, so inside the cell, antioxidant. And what it does, is it basically, it, it binds up these, these free electrons and then it gets recycled by uh, vitamin C and vitamin E uh, particularly. Uh, so, you, so you can basically remove these. However, if you have too much, you can overcome uh, the, the systems of the body that deal with oxidative stress. And then, the, you know, these unpaired electrons are very reactive. So they can create a lot of damage. So they can damage cell membranes. They can damage proteins. These things then aggregate um, or you can, you know, damage the, the cell wall and the cell, you know, the cells can die. So, so basically- These are free radicals, right? These are free radicals. Yeah, that's yeah. another great name for it. And it doesn't yeah. have to be oxygen. It can also be uh, nitrogen. So we have something called nitrosative stress, which is essentially the same thing, but happening on nitrogen molecules rather than oxygens. Um, but the important thing to mention is this is just part of normal metabolism. We're making these things all the time and we're, de and we're dealing with them. Uh, when we have them in small doses, then we create a more robust system that's better to adapt to them, better to, to, to soak them up. But, you know, if we put too much stress on the body, so, you know, overtraining being a, a, a nice example, you can deplete your reserves, overcome that, and then you get sort of like the downstream damaging effects. I'm just going to put you on the spot here. If you could design your own research project, if Bill Gates came along, well, I mean, it's a bit controversial because he might put a microchip in you, but <laughs> if a philanthropist came along, and gave you enough money to do whatever research project you could in the field of long COVID, yeah. what, would, what would you want to do? Well, the, the problem is that part of what I would want to do is be able to understand what's happening in people before they get long COVID, right? So, so but if you can create a big, if you can uh, create a big enough population database, then you will pick up some people who haven't had COVID yet. Um, and then see, you know, and you could, you know, I would do all their blood tests. I'd probably do, you know, some genetics. I'd want to know about their sleep and stress and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, I'd see who then, you know, turns into to the long COVID. Like what, what's, the, what's the common factor that, that's underlying all of that? Um, you know, that, that's kind of one part. That's the epidemiological part. And I, I think that we're kind of picking up on bits and pieces here, but we don't have a really great understanding of all the things that, that could be contributing. Um, and then on the other side, I'd, I'd want to uh, investigate, I'd do something like a, um, a smart uh, trial, which is like a, a multi-randomization trial where uh, you take people who have long COVID and you randomize them to all the different things I mentioned. So maybe some of them get knack, some of them get an extra portion of liver, some of them get some sleep therapy, and then you follow them and then you see how their symptoms do. And then when they stall or they don't respond, you then randomize them to the next thing. Uh, and in that way, rather than doing like one big randomized controlled trial where you test everything or you test one thing, you can test lots, lots of things over time and see how how who responds how they respond and then you get an idea like of like what is the type of person that's going to respond to a certain type of thing um and this this is kind of like the the future step of randomized controlled trials so i'd probably do some kind of smart trial with all the things that that we've that we've mentioned that would be that my idea my ideal um and obviously you come from like a sort of a, a very much a pure science background but it feels like in the sort of the discussions around recovery there are the schools of thought which are like, I need this drug and this drug and this supplement and whatever, this is how I get better. And mm. then there's the school of thought, which is I need to change my environment, remove my stress levels, connect more with myself and let my body heal itself. Now, 
and, and that is the woo-woo side <laughs> of healing. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I grew up with a woo-woo mum who was into acupuncture and everything else. So I am. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, so I'm sympathetic. <laughs> I'm sympathetic to that. And I actually think that the actual, I don't think there is going to be one magic bullet here, but I was just wondering if you could talk to some of that side. Where, where does the science and the woo meet here? Is there somewhere where it meets in terms of the influence of environment and stress and state of mind on the body's metabolism and its ability mm. to heal and everything else? Yeah. So, so I think we're, we're now getting to a point where, you know, two important things have happened. One, we have appreciated that the head is not separate from the rest of the body. <laughs> they influence one another uh, intimately. And that's that's very important. Uh, and secondly, that, you know, all these sort of woo woo lifestyle and environment things are increasingly appreciated as important parts of long term health. And if you ask me, I think they are the critical reason why we have such a sick population uh, nowadays. And, and you have things like, um, so in the UK, you have the, the, a big lifestyle medicine movement, the British Soci Society of Lifestyle Medicine, I'm a, I'm a founding uh, trustee of, um, and now has you know, thousands of members and you know, diplomas for uh, GPs. You know, people are actually actively you know, taking part uh, you know, and learning about this and, and applying it in, in their clinical practice. So I think that's very important. So we're now getting to a point where you know, this stuff isn't that woo anymore. Like we, we know the importance of sleep. We know the importance of social uh, connection. Um, you know, if you think about the, the, if you heard about the Froome project and social prescribing, um, uh, Julian, the work of Julian Abel basically showing that if you uh, create better connections in the community, then you reduce uh, hospitaliza hospitalizations and the burden on the healthcare system because, you know, th these social connections have a huge uh, benefit to, to people's health. So, so we know now that this is, this is important. And I think, you know, focusing on that um, is, is probably going to be the critical thing. Um, one, one thing that I'm generally con concerned about in terms of how our um, what we th what we think about affects our our health, it affects our physiology. Uh, is particularly in terms of like saying, you know, I'm going to need this supplement, or I have this genetic uh, mutation, and then this that makes me bad at this particular process. Um, we now know that what you tell yourself, what you think, probably has a bigger effect on your physiology than the actual thing that you, you're worried about. So there's data from type two diabetics that says, um, uh, if you tell people that a given meal has more carbohydrates in it, they'll have a bigger blood sugar spike, even though they kept the carbohydrates the same. So, so here's a low carb drink, here's a high carb drink, different glucose responses, but it was the same drink. So what you expect to happen affects your blood sugar. Uh, we also know that if I tell you that you have, um, if, I, if I, there's a really nice study where uh, they put people on a treadmill, had them do a, a treadmill exercise test, then afterwards, they said, did you know that you have a gene that makes you bad at exercise, bad at endurance exercise? And then they put them back on the treadmill and they did worse, even though that was they were just randomized. That, that wasn't true. You know, they were just if you were just told you had bad genes, you perform less well. We also know that if you randomize people to tell them they had a poor night of sleep from their sleep tracker, then they feel like they slept less well and their cognitive function declines regardless of how they actually slept. So there's so much um, evidence now to say that if you create this worry, this thing that you think is going to affect your physiology, that will affect your physiology regardless of whether that thing is true or not. So that's, you know, when, when we're creating these stories, I really worry that we'll sort of create you will create this negative effect in our physiology because of the story that's, that, that's being put together. And so that, that's just, you know, in relation to you have to do this or you have to take this supplement or if you don't do this, then you're going to get worse. Like, so any of those stories, I would be really, uh, you know, concerned about because they can be internalized and then they can affect physiology regardless of whether they're true or not. And this is where I think things like yoga and meditation and breath work and anything that you can do to interrupt thought patterns that may be perpetuating a feeling or an identity of being sick is really important. So there's plenty more to come in this series. Together with respiratory consultants and fellow long hauler, Dr. Asad Khan, we're gonna be speaking to Dr. Svetlana Blitzstein about dysautonomia, Dr. Bruce Patterson about pathophysiology, Dr. Nick Gall about heart rhythm disorders and cardiac problems with long COVID, and Dr. Ben Marsh about fatigue management. And that's just for starters. So till next time.